The tour that followed was fraught with difficulties. Matters came to a head at a record signing in a shop in Aberdeen. We walked into the record shop and they were playing Join Hands. John immediately took it off and put the Slits album on, which had come out the same week, um, because he couldn't bear to hear it again. So Susie got, you know, her hackles are rising already. And we started signing a few things. And then Polydor basically made the mistake of not actually giving, supplying the shop with enough records. So Niels had a box of promo albums in, in the back of the van. And they were stamped with gold, not for resale. So I presumed that we were just going to hand a few out on the way around the tour, not all in the record shop, but just on the way around the tour, hand a couple of hours promotional copies, um, which may have been naive, but that's what I thought. And as soon as John Mackay saw that it was being sold, he went ballistic without finding out, and he started giving them away. And I think that's when Susie clocked him. <laughs> I stood there for a second and then looked at Kenny. Kenny looked at me and we just walked straight out. Uh, we actually walked down the road to a coffee shop and sat down there and tried to calm down. But um, it was just the last insult, really. Um, it was a misunderstanding, as it turns out, uh, but it was just the last straw. We went straight to Soundcheck, fully expecting to see them there. And, um, you know, they, they didn't show and they didn't show again. I packed, Kenny packed, we ordered a cab, we got in the cab, uh, and it wasn't until we were sitting in the cab that Niels turned up. Saying, I've invested £45,000 in this tour. It could have been pointed out, even, even then it was a crazy thing to do. Anyway, he had me, his hand on my, on my neck. But by the time Niels was, was hanging through the taxi window saying, you'll never work again, uh, that was the last of our worries, really. There was nothing more to do but wind up the window on his arm. I was only too pleased to see him in some agony. It fucking flushed everything down the toilet, basically. And I, I just thought it's such a shitty thing to do to anyone, let alone somebody you'd practically live with for two years. And I remember, I don't mind admitting, turning to John Mackay and saying, but we're not going to the station. Why? Because that's the first place Susie's going to look. And I know Susie. Um, she'll go to every carriage on the rampage and she'll search under every seat. Of course she did. If I'd have been able to get my hold on, hands on either of them, I, I feel sure I would have become close to throttling the life out of them. And we went to Glasgow Airport and paid the taxi they actually let the steps down of the little plane because it was going and let us get over the thing and everything, jump on this little plane. And it wouldn't go as, wasn't going as far as um, London, so we got a lift on a coach. We were the only two people on the coach and the driver was crazy. He drove at must have been 120 miles an hour in the night in the rain and it was just like something in a dream. Went and stayed at John's uncle's um, house for one night and then we um, went off to friend's cottage in Somerset, in the middle of nowhere. And lucky we did, because we opened the papers the following day, and Banshee split, and Susie quoted us sort of saying, if you have one ounce of the hatred or something that we have for, for those arty ones, um, you, you uh, can kill them in my name. Banshees, now with Budgie as a permanent member, continued as a band, but the traumatic departure of Kenny Morris and John Mackay had left its mark on all involved. It left us completely bereft of uh, record company, group, management, everything. Uh, they kind of convinced themselves for a little while that um, we'd planned it, but it just doesn't make sense. As soon as we got off the road, I was just in bed for about a month. Anyway, I did a lot of writing and one of the songs was called Drop Dead, which was to a certain duo. I thought it'd be great if there was a singing telegram with, you know, some dead roses that turned up at, at somebody's doorstop. He completely loathed, so I, I invented a kind of a singing telegram to wish somebody ill. Drop dead, you stinking milk. 
kind of enjoy doing that. In the Banshees, the core trio of Susie, Budgie and Severin, with the addition of John Carruthers and later Martin McCarrick and John Klein, recorded in the second half of the 80s some of their most successful LPs. They had not seen nor spoken to one of their ex-guitarists, John Mackay, since 1979, when he abandoned them mid-tour. Then, ten years later, on his honeymoon in a small hotel in the Lake District, his past caught up with him. We went down to dinner that night and went to sit down and uh, our hosts came over and said, no, we've got a table for you, it's just over here. And we looked down to the other end of the room and there sitting in the bay window was Susie and Budgie. Oh, so we end up being like, the, like some, you know, four of maybe eight residents in this hotel isolated in the middle of the late district and we were sitting there, what are we going to talk about? You know, Sue and I hadn't spoken since 79, basically. Uh, and we sat down and had the meal, all had indigestion, I think. Linda got a bottle of vodka from the room and got us talking. And by the end of the evening, we kind of patched things up. I, I don't know if we'd actually covered everything, but we understood one another a bit more. And it wasn't daggers drawn anymore. And it was just such a, an incredible coincidence anyway that, you know, it's the sort of thing you can't fight. <laughs> 